When Charlotte Salomon decided to tell her life story in pictures in 1942, she began and ended the story with the question, life or theatre? Now this could just as well be the beginning and the end of Goethe's second novel, Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahre, William Master's Apprenticeship. From the very beginning to the very end, the question hangs in the air, life or theater. The novel starts with the sentence, I'm reading from uh, the collected works in English, the play lasted for a very long time. And we have to read this with a little chuckle, remembering what Wagner said to Faust at the beginning of Faust, alas, that art is long and human life so short. So, what's it going to be? Life or theatre? My name's John Noyes and I'm here to guide you through the reading of all of Goethe's novels. When I first read William Master's Apprenticeship as an undergraduate, I was truly puzzled by the fact that the novel begins with such heavy emphasis on the theatre. The entire first book revolves around the theatre. It was only later that I started to understand that there are good historical, epistemological, and even psychoanalytic reasons for doing this. And this is what I'd like to explore today. The historical reasons have to do with the emergence of the middle classes, um, economic and political and public emergence of the middle classes in Germany during Goethe's time. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, epistemological, what can and can't be known about the world. Um, how does one gain access to nature and the world? And then finally, psychoanalytic, um, what paths of representation lead to the inner life of the subject. I'd like to begin with reference to an essay that Georg Lukas wrote in 1936 on William Master's apprenticeship. Um, and I'm going to stick with this essay for a while because it has very good insights into where the theatre sits in this novel. Lukas begins by positioning uh, this novel as um, what he calls the most important product of the literary transition from the 18th to the 19th century. And it's no accident, he says, that the definitive edition was written during the years 1793 to 95, the period where the revolutionary crisis of transition between the two eras reached its apex in France. There is a prototype of this novel that Lukas refers to, and Goethe called it Wilhelm Meister's Theatralische Sendung, William Master's Theatrical Mission, which he began writing in um, 1777, shortly after he had completed Werther. And um, the connection to Werther is plain in this initial version. Um, it's uh, the tension between an artistic sensibility and the constraints of life in um, middle-class society that concerns Wilhelm here. And that's what he's going to begin with in um, the later version of the novel. But he's only going to begin with it because as Lukas goes on to point out, the theater is the goal in, um, in the earlier novel, but it's only a transition point in, um, in, in the later version. And to that I would add that although it's a transition point, it's a transition point which is um, aufgehoben, if I can use the Hegelian language. Uh, the significance of the theatre, although Wilhelm moves beyond it, it st remains as a structuring um, feature in Wilhelm's later experiences of life. In, uh, in Lukas' words, 
uh, the problem of the theatre and drama completely dominates the first draft. And of course the theatre here means the liberation of a poetic soul from the impoverished and prosaic confinement of the bourgeois world. In the later edition, the problem extends to the relationship of the humanist cultivation of the whole personality to the world of bourgeois society. When the hero of the apprenticeship definitely decides to go into the theatre, he poses the question as follows. What good is it to manufacture good iron if my whole soul is filled with slag? And what good is it to put a country in order if I am always at odds with myself? And what at this point motivates his decision is his insight that only the theatre will enable him fully to develop his human capacities under the given social conditions. So that's, so that's the first point from Lukash, that the theatre is a sociological tool, if I can put it like that. When it comes to the sociological dimension of the novel, or um, I suppose uh, we could speak of the political dimension of the novel too. Goethe doesn't keep us guessing. He leaves this more or less on the surface. The first time this strikes us, and I think it strikes us quite explicitly, is in uh, book one already, chapter nine, when um, Wilhelm uh, is um, in a kind of a little slightly delusional fantasy about his future in the theatre, and uh, Goethe writes, He was young and inexperienced in the ways of the world, eager to seek happiness and contentment anywhere, and elated by love. That his future lay in the theatre had now become quite clear to him, and the high goal that he envisioned for himself seemed nearer to realisation as he aspired to the hand of Marianne. In self-satisfied modesty, he saw in himself the great actor, the founder of a future national theatre that he heard various people pining for. I'm not going to say anything about the deep ironic tone of the narrator right now, that's for next week, um, but it's important. Um, the narrator sees things about Wilhelm and about the theatre that he can't see himself. So let, let's stick with this statement about a national theatre that um, Wilhelm has vaguely heard people pining for. The direct reference here is to Lessing, who from 1767 to 1770 was uh, the dramaturg of the National Theatre in Hamburg, and he produced um, a, uh, a series of essays that he called the Hamburg Dramaturgy, written at the same time. One of Lessing's chief aspirations at the Hamburg National Theatre was the creation of a new theatre for the middle classes, because at the time the theatre of the middle classes was in um, slightly dire straits. We can read about this in Book 4, Chapter 19, when we learn about Serlo's background. We read there, In the short time that he, Serlo, spent with theatrical troops, some small, some large, he took note of the special characteristics of all the plays and their actors. The monotony prevailing at that time on the German stage, the Alexandrians with their ludicrous sound and rhythm, the dialogue that was either stilted or flat, the trivial and tedious moralizing, all this he observed. So this, this was the state of the German stage when Lessing sought to reform it. And the German stage was a rather underfunded, to say the least, and a pitiful phenomenon. The dominant theater, certainly when it came to um, patronage, was probably the French theatre of the courts. And again, um, we, may, we, we read passing reference to this in Wilhelm Meister. When Melina's troop arrives at the court of the Count, the Count's wife makes the following statement on page 85. Who is that? asked the Countess as she went into the inn. An actress, and at your grace's service. The Count saw several people standing around who also claimed to be actors and inquired how large the company was, where they had last performed, and who their director was. If they're French, he said to his wife, we might delight the Prince with an unexpected pleasure by providing his favorite form of entertainment in our house. 
Even if these people are unfortunately only Germans, said the Countess, we still might seriously think of letting them perform at the castle while the prince is there. Lessing saw this domination of the theater in Germany by the nobility who were funding it, by their location in the courts, and also by what we could refer to as French cultural imperialism. And Lessing sought to write against all of this. He developed what um, subsequently came to be known as bourgeois tragedy. And the idea here was humanist. This is a humanist view of tragedy, where suffering is not restricted to class. Suffering is something that binds humans together. And this is also the significance of Shakespeare in Wilhelm Meister. Lukas makes reference to that. On page 51 of Goethe and his Age, Lukas writes, for Goethe, Shakespeare is a great educator toward a fully developed sense of humanity and personality. His dramas are models showing how the development of personality was accomplished in the great periods of humanism and how it should be accomplished in the present. Now, because of the fact that French cultural imperialism dominates the stage and it dominates it in the location of the court of the nobility, the struggle for a humanist theatre first of all happens along class lines, and this is the significance of the development of a German theatre in Wilhelm Meister. And I'm going to read you a couple of examples of where we see this, more or less on the surface of the action. Take a look at page 69. Wilhelm is um, operating with uh, Melina in Melita, Melina's troupe, and the narrator observes, at that time, the latest thing in the theater was plays that were attracting great attention and approval from the public about medieval German knights. And then further, everyone was inflamed by national fervor. Being Germans, they were delighted to indulge poetically in a piece that expressed their own national character and played on their native soil. And this nationalistic take on the theater reaches a climax in Book 4, Chapter 16, when Aurelia is talking about her experiences in the theatre. She says, I too was once in that blissful state when I went on the stage with the highest opinion of myself and my nation. I'm reading on page 153. There was nothing that in my imagination the Germans didn't possess and nothing that they could not develop and nothing that they could not develop into. I spoke to my nation from my slightly elevated platform, edged by lights whose brightness and smoke obscured my view of what was in front of me. Again, you can't miss Goethe's irony. And I'm going to say more about this in a minute. Um, the smoke and lights of the stage obscured what was in front of her. Uh, this is the epistemological problem of the theatre. She carries on, how, how glad I was at the sound of the applause that floated up from the crowd, how grateful for this tribute of acclaim from so many different hands. I went on like this for a long time, lulling myself through the good relationship I had with a public that responded to everything I offered them, into a sense of complete harmony with the noblest and best of my nation. For I thought that this was what I saw before me. So in all of this, only one thing matters, and that is the humanistic transcendence of class. It's easy to get Goethe wrong on this point, because if you read the novel a certain way, it looks like a celebration of the nobility. Probably the most explicit statement of this is in chapter 3 of book 5 on page 174, where Wilhelm, in a letter, says, if I were a nobleman, our disagreement would soon be settled, but since I belong to the middle classes, I must stake out my own path, and I hope you will understand what I'm doing. I don't know how it is in other countries, but it seems to me that in Germany, general education of the self is possible only in the nobility. The middle class can acquire merit, and if driven to extremes, develop the mind, but in so doing, it loses its personality, however it presents itself. And then he goes on to say that the nobleman is a public person. 
What counts in the life of the nobleman is what he is. What counts in the life of the bourgeois citizen is what he possesses. And I'm deliberately using the male pronoun. Reading this passage, uh, the German poet Novalis described Goethe's novel as eine Wahlfahrt zum Adelsdiplom, as a pilgrimage to acquisition of the standing of the nobility. Against this, I think that Lukács is right in emphasizing the humanist, classless aspirations of the novel, the utopian transcendence of class. And I'm just going to read you what Lukács says about that. He says, the realization of humanist ideals in this novel proves time and again the necessity to reject birth and social position in their full nullity, as soon as it is a question of the purely human. And um, Lukács is quoting Schiller here. Lukács then goes on, the humanist social criticism is aimed not only at the capitalistic division of labor, but also at the constriction and deformation of human nature due to all constraints resulting from the existence and consciousness of social rank. And we can certainly recognize here a theme that was developed in Werther. And this is exactly what Goethe himself had set as one of his tasks when he took over the um, direction of the Weimar Court Theatre. Karl August had moved the court theatre to um, the so-called Comedian House in 1791. And when we look at this humanist intention of the uh, court theatre or the national theatre, not its nationalistic tendencies, but its humanistic tendencies, there we can see the real political significance of what's going on in the theatre, and also the political significance of the theatre in the novel. And this is a significance that we still need to think about today, probably even more than in Goethe's time, because it's a question of how to use media, in this case the theatre, how, and how to use institutionalized media, in this case the theatre, in order to establish a public which is capable of having democratic effects. There's probably no better statement of this around that time than Kant's essay on Enlightenment of 1784, which, if I can just reduce it to one single thought, which is that there can be no democracy without a public. And this is crucial for today's global crisis in democracy. So um, this alone, I think, makes uh, this aspect of the novel extremely interesting for us today because our crisis of democracy is intimately connected to the demise of the public sphere and the demise of the public sphere is intimately connected to the failure of institutions to create a public sphere. And this leads us directly to the epistemological question. Without a functional public sphere, what can we and what can't we know? Or even if we do try to establish a public sphere, a functional public sphere, what are the limits of knowledge in that public sphere? And how are they constrained by the form of the institution itself? This is the epistemological problem of the theater in Wilhelm Meister. This brings me to the final point that I want to talk about today, and that is the question of knowledge, appearance, acting, performing. And um, in this discussion, I'm going to wrap in the two aspects that I mentioned at the beginning, the epistemological and the psychoanalytic. And I hope that by the time I'm finished, um, I'm going to keep it relatively short, but I hope that by the time I'm finished, um, it will be clear where these two interact. So again, I'm concentrating first of all on uh, book one, where a dominant theme is this life or theater theme of appearances. The German word that occurs again and again is shine. Shine, which can mean both the shining of a light, it can also mean that which one sees but which is not necessarily true. And this is translated in a number of ways. So. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to point out a few 
sections in um, in the first book where Goethe makes it abundantly clear to us that appearances are not necessarily always reliable. And incidentally, by doing this, he's keying in on one of the philosophical questions of the time, whether knowledge emerges out of experience or whether there is some inherent mode of knowing um, whereby the world can be apprehended a priori. This was Kant's response to Hume, and um, it's also uh, what Kant was dealing with in the Critique of Judgment, which Goethe had read um, five years previously. So right away we have this episode where Marianne and um, Barbara are um, they're, they're quarreling, um, and Marianne uh, is wearing the the costume that she wore on stage and she's come home and um, Barbara says to her on page two go and change I hope you will apologize as a girl for the harm you did me as a flighty officer this is the part she was acting on stage off with the coat and with everything underneath it it's an uncomfortable cons costume and dangerous for you and remember, Barbara is the one that wants her to act out a role in relationship to Wilhelm. In fact, let's just go to that place. In chapter 12 of this first book, um, Barbara is going to say to Marianne on page 23, the director's stubborn insistence on maintaining the good morals of his actors can be used to our advantage. Both your lovers, are accustomed to go to work secretly and cautiously. I'll arrange the time and place, but you play the part I assign you. Barbara wants to be the director in this stage play of life, which she wants to stage for her own and Marianne's, she thinks, benefit. And when the narrator turns to Wilhelm's passion, he also carries forth this same doubt about appearances and essence. If you look at the beginning of chapter 3 on page 4, we read, It was on the wings of imagination that Wilhelm's desire for this charming girl soared. He won her affection after a short acquaintance, and soon found himself in possession of someone he both loved and worshipped. She had first appeared in the flattering light of a theatrical performance. And the word Goethe used for appeared here is erscheinen. And then um, her deception is alluded to. And her own ambiguous situation, her fear that he might discover all too soon what her position was, this gave her a pleasing semblance of modesty and anxiety, which only enhanced his fondness for her. A pleasing semblance, the word is anschein. As she loved him so dearly, her uneasiness only increased her tenderness. And uh, Goethe didn't write only increased, he wrote only appeared to increase her, at her tenderness. And again, the word he uses is shine. So um, Wilhelm's passion and his love um, is built upon theatrical deception. And every step of the way in their relationship, this tension between appearance and essence is kept going. Um, look at page 10. Um, Wilhelm has been passionately declaring um, his love for the theater. He's been telling the story of how he fell in love with the theater as a child. Um, and then uh, when he's done, the narrator tells us, during this long recital, Marianne had been at pains to conceal her sleepiness by mustering all her affection toward Wilhelm. Amusing as the whole business might seem in one sense, she found it all too simple, and Wilhelm's commentary too ponderous. She would tenderly place her foot on his, and gave what appeared to be signs of attentiveness and approval. Again, Goethe writes, scheinbare Zeichen. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we've been told that this is what the theatre is about. When we read about Wilhelm's gradual initiation into the charm and magic and illusion and deception of the theatre, then we read on page 8, 
Um, fortunately, all this occurred just when the lieutenant had proposed to initiate me into the secrets of the performance. My mother told him about my unexpected talent, and the lieutenant managed to get permission to use some rooms on the top floor of the house, which were usually empty, one for the spectators and one for the actors, with the doorway between as proscenium. My father allowed his friend to do all this, pretended not to be aware of it, as he was convinced that one ought not to let children see how much one loves them, or else they will ever ask for more. One should appear stern while they are enjoying themselves. One should appear stern, man soll ernst scheinen, is what Goethe writes. So when it comes to this question of illusion, of shine, the narrator is setting Wilhelm up for failure. And this is going to happen again and again in the book. Um, the narrator is going to show how the complicated mix of a priori knowledge and experience um, is driving Wilhelm onward through this voyage of self-discovery. And part of the voyage is the theatrical appreciation, if I can put it like that, or the theatrical experience of the world's illusions. On page 30, at the beginning of chapter 15, we read, He, Wilhelm, would often stand in the wings once he had been allowed this privilege by the manager, and although the illusion disappeared from this perspective, the far greater magic of love began to operate, etc., etc. And at the end of this paragraph, um, it says, even the dancers, so ugly at close quarters, did not displease him, for they were on one and the same stage with his dearly beloved. The love needed to bring life to rose bushes, myrtle groves, and moonlight can certainly also endow wood chips and paper snippers with a degree of real live existence. Goethe's German for a degree of real live existence is der Anschein belebter Naturen the appearance or illusion of animated nature. And once we have worked our way through the function of illusion and appearance and deception in book one, we are prepared to follow Wilhelm on this process of working through illusion and delusion in order to arrive at some kind of a stable sense of self. And this is what the Bildung in the Bildungsroman is going to be about. It's going to be about fighting your way through knowledge and self-knowledge and misknowledge, um, if, there, if that's a word, unknowledge, um, or deception, let me just say deception, um, in order to stabilize your representations of yourself. And this is where the psychoanalytic dimension of um, self-formation comes in. I think that's enough for today. So um, I will now say um, goodbye and auf Wiedersehen until next week. See you then. <laughs>